because of time's sake, we're going to go ahead and just get into the studies tonight, and hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end to sing a song or two. Um, but right now, as I promised last week, we're going to get into one of the studies that uh, will need to be done at some point. There's no way, brethren, we could, we could study together in this setting all the many subjects, topics, lessons that you might need to give in a evangelistic class. Uh, but there are certain studies, and it depends on the person. It always depends on the person and their need. But there are certain studies that are commonly done, commonly given. The lesson on Catholicism, pretty common. Um, lesson on Bible, basic Bible authority, very, very common. At some point, there will need to be some kind of lesson on basic Bible authority. Uh, why is that? Why is it important? that this person have a great respect for the Bible as the authority before you proceed much further in your studies. Well, how wide is the inside of this building here? If I ask 20 people in the room right now to tell me the distance from that wall to this wall here, I would probably get 20 different answers. And the reason for that is because we're trusting ourselves. We're looking at that and we're giving, you know, a subjective estimate of the distance between those two walls. Now, all of those 20 may be wrong, but they can't all be right. Is there any way to know exactly the distance between that wall and this wall? Of course, get a measure. And if you put one in there, bring it down to this wall here. As long as we all respect the measure being used, we can come up and be in agreement on the numbers that are there. But we have to respect the measure. And then we can know exactly the distance from that wall to that wall, because that's what the measure says. Now, the measure may prove everybody wrong. But one thing is certain, the measure is right. But we have to agree on the measure. And so this study helps build respect for the Bible as the only moral measure of man. And of course, in judgment, Jesus says, these words I spoke will judge you at the last day, John 12, 48. It's a basic study on Bible authority. We're just going to basically peruse the information that's here, if you would, the sheet with the circles. We're just gonna go through this uh, pretty quickly cover the main points of this study, and it begins with a definition of authority, the right to command and enforce obedience. Uh, anarchy is an opposite to the idea of authority, lawless confusion and disorder. When you don't have authority, then you'll have anarchy. When there's no standard or when there's a lack of respect for the standard, you're going to have anarchy. Now, God is, the first circle there, absolute in authority. He has inherent authority because he's the potter, we're the clay. His authority is innate. It's absolute. Unlimited in power, unlimited in wisdom, unlimited in presence. God has absolute inherent authority. But he gave that authority to his son, Jesus, and at this point, especially, you know, we'll need to look at a number of passages that show that God gave all authority to his son, Jesus. And I've given a few there. You can use, obviously, this study or any study that you choose. There are many, many good studies on this subject. This is one that I've used through the years many, many times. Uh, if you use this study or this chart, you may use different passages. These are Bible passages that I have used through the years. But uh, when it comes to Jesus, Moses, and Deuteronomy, 
18 said, God will raise up a prophet like unto myself. You must, you must listen to him. And Peter quotes that passage in Acts 3, 22 and 23, and says, if we do not give heed to everything he says, we shall be destroyed. That's tremendous authority. And of course, that authority is Jesus. Uh, Hebrews chapter, nine, uh, chapter 5, verse 9, he's the source of salvation to all who obey him. Matthew 28, 18, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. So Jesus was given authority from the Father. Um, but Jesus then promised the apostles, look at John 16 now with me, John 16. Just hours, maybe minutes before his arrest, in John 16, he says this to his disciples. Someone read uh, John 16, verse 12 and 13, please. Very, very important passage in a study like this especially. John 16. Who wants to read that for us? Yes, sir. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. The Spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. Very limited time remaining before that arrest, betrayal, of course, the scourging. And so... Jesus says to them, I'm not leaving you as orphans, but I will send the Spirit, and he will guide you into how much truth? All truth. I believe Jesus, and so I believe that all truth was revealed, truth for salvation, to the, through, through the Holy Spirit to the apostles. Not some of it, not most of it all of it. He will guide you into all truth. And so all truth was revealed through the Holy Spirit, through the apostles, therefore, in that first century. Not 600 years later through Muhammad, or 1,800 years later to Joseph Smith, Mary Baker, Ella Patterson Eddy, and any number of other people claiming Latter-day Revelation. This is an extremely important statement here in John 16 and verse 13. All truth was revealed to the apostles in that first century. So the Holy Spirit would come and uh, reveal all truth to the apostles. And then if you would uh, look at John 17, someone read John 17 and verse 8, please. John 17 and verse 8. Who would like to read that? John 17 and verse 8. Yes, So much is in that one statement there. Of course, the whole chapter is a prayer. And Jesus is talking about, again, delegated authority, praying for his apostles. Most of the prayer is for his apostles that have been chosen. And Jesus, in that prayer, says, Father, the word you've given to me. And when I do the study, I've got a pretty good-sized chart, and I'm pointing all this out as I go. I've given to them a little bit of role-playing here, I've given to them, and they receive them, these words, and they believe that I came forth from thee. So you see how the authority is being passed from father to son, and then delegated to the apostles. Now, that authority is coming in the form of words. Words. Those words are very, very important. The seed is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. And Brian, uh, Adam and his class emphasized that again. That seed is the word of God. And it, it grows in the good and honest heart. And it produces salvation in the good and honest heart. That's, that's how we give to God something that he doesn't have. Our love. That's the one thing. Right, Matthew, that God doesn't have is our love. And, and we give to that, we give that to him freely or we don't. But it's the word of God that brings that about. 
And uh, that's the, the authority Jesus is passing down in these, in these words. And then, um, of course, the apostles, what if we reject the apostles? Did Jesus uh, have something to say about that? He did. Look at Matthew 10 and verse 40 and Luke 10 and verse 16. And so what if someone says, well, you're not Jesus. You're just John. You're just James. Why should I listen to you? So what does Jesus say in Matthew 10, 40 and in Luke 10, 16, which is what a lot of people say. Well, it's just Paul. It's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But who's got Matthew 10, 40? I'd like to read that for us. Yes, sir. So the principle of delegation, I'm sending you out, you're my ambassadors. If they receive you, then they're receiving me. Conversely, if they reject them, then they're rejecting Jesus. Okay, what about uh, Luke 10, 16? Jared, you want to get that too? Luke 10, 16. So he covers both sides of it in Luke's account. If you accept them, you accept me. If you reject them, you reject me. Uh, so the principle of delegation. If we reject the apostles, that needs to be emphasized because there'll be studies down the road where that will come in very, very important, um, especially in Paul's writings. If we reject Paul, it's the same as rejecting Jesus. And if you reject Jesus, you're rejecting the Father. Okay, uh, Eddie, did you have your hand up? Okay, yes, sir. Yeah, on the written word part, or okay, all right. So, um, and of course, Paul will say things like um, in Philippians four, verse nine: "The things you've heard, learned, received from me, practice, and God will be with you." What if I refuse to practice what I see and I've heard and received from Paul? God will not be with me. So he is an ambassador of Jesus Christ, and I, I need to listen to him because he's only the messenger of Jesus Christ. So the apostles eventually spoke this word, and the spoken word became the written word. And the written word, we find, is as authoritative as the spoken word. And there's, there's many passages here. Obviously, many more could be given. Uh, in Kevin's class, we read the passage there, in 1 John, John emphasizing in verse 2 and 3, he said, these things I have written that you may have fellowship with us, he says, uh, us being the apostles. Uh, and indeed, he says, our fellowship is with God. And he's talking about the gospel. These things I have written. And so, uh, the same gospel that brought John and the other apostles into fellowship with God will bring us into fellowship, not only with them, but with God as well. So we come to God through that gospel. It's the power, 116, Romans 116, and we must abide in the gospel in order for that fellowship to continue. We don't come to God through the gospel and then abandon it. We must abide within that teaching, seek to follow it and learn, grow in it, uh, of course, all our lives. Eddie, do you want to make a point now? Or? Yeah, and this, this idea of the importance of the word is just absolutely terrible. Yeah. From the very story of creation, how did God create everything? So he yeah. spoke. Yeah. And then in John 6, when the disciples started to leave Jesus, and he asked his own 12, said, do you want to go away also? Peter's response was, Lord, to whom we go, you have the words of mm -hmm. eternal life. Yeah. And then John 12, which you got in here, you know, where Jesus talked about if you reject my words, my words will condemn you. Yeah. And in the context, he's also talking about that words will give life. Yes. And so 
the, you know, people kind of look at the Bible and sort of say, well, it's a good book. Or, you know, yeah. there's some things in there that I can learn from. These are the words of life. Amen. Every word in there. Yeah. And if we reject or neglect any word in there, we're neglecting life itself. Yeah, amen. Well said. Uh, there used to be a saying that said, God said it. Uh, I believe it. That settles it. Remember that? It's not correct. It's incorrect. How should it read? God said it. That settles it. Whether or not I believe it, God's word is forever settled in heaven. Psalm 119. God's word is that seed. Remember, God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. God's breath is life. And what does the word inspiration mean? Inspiration. God breathed. All scripture is God breathed and is profitable. It's from God, it should be profitable. Indeed, it is. Teaching, reproof, training, instruction, and righteousness. So it gives life. It's the power that we have to have. There is no life apart from the seed of God's word. It's seed, but it only grows in the good and honest heart. And, but we've got to make sure it is the seed that we're planting. Learn it. Handle the word accurately. Preach it boldly and humbly. And then get out of God's way. And let his word do its work. Let his word do its work. So uh, many, many other passages talk about the, the authority of scriptures. Maybe one other one we'll look at here. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. I love this statement uh, made by Paul. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Who's got that passage for us? Yes, please. For this reason, we also constantly thank, thank God that when you received from us the word of God's message, we accepted it not as the word of men, but the word of really you, the word of God, which also performs the word of you. Paul's putting it out there. He says, You understand that I am just a vehicle, I am relaying this eternal message. And you accepted it that way as the message from God. And I am simply the messenger uh, of the Lord. And that's the way we need to teach this word. It's the message of God. And we're just trying to relay what God has said. And in such a way that uh, we don't get in God's way. Okay, so then we have over here, outside of all of that, um, we have man. And so we want to, here's man, and we are to look into that written word. And here's where we make the point with our student that when we look into the written word based on things that we've been teaching now, uh, maybe a week, a couple of weeks, a few weeks with someone, when we look into that written word, who are we really looking to? If we, if we accept this written word, who are we truly accepting? God himself. And if we reject that written word, we're not rejecting Paul or Peter or James, you know, or John. We're rejecting God. And we need to get that across to people. Otherwise, your labors will be in vain. And so it's very, very important to maybe begin with a study like this or at some point work a study like this in. Um, and there's, there's other passages here. I usually end with some of the warnings of Scripture. Anyone have any more comments or questions about this particular study? Uh, we've got one of, if you would look at the other uh, handout sheet that was given to you, this is the study that goes along with that study, God's unfolding plan. Again, a foundational study on building respect for the Bible as the authority of God. So let's just go through this, this sheet briefly. God's unfolding plan. The gospel was first taught by word of mouth. 
in keeping with the prophecy, all must be learned and taught of God. The gospel was first taught by word of mouth, going to all the world, preached the gospel to every creature. The apostles went everywhere preaching the whole counsel of God. Now, I believe when Paul went to Ephesus in Acts 20 and he says, I withheld nothing profitable, I taught you the whole counsel of God. He knew the whole counsel of God at that point because that's what he says. Now, they were then given these gifts to remind them of what Paul had been saying, the prophecy and the tongues and, and knowledge and things like that because Paul couldn't stay, but the whole counsel of God was taught. It wasn't written down yet. It wasn't written down, but it was taught. Now, if the whole counsel of God was taught, doesn't that agree with what Jesus says in John 16, 13? The Holy Spirit will come and guide you into all truth. And, and I believe that's what Paul is saying. It, it was revealed then once for all, not once in a while. Uh, and then number three, by AD 64, this gospel was preached throughout the world. Jesus said it had to be, Matthew 24, 14. It had to be preached throughout the world. And in Colossians 1, 23 says it was. Uh, before the end of the first century, the spoken word became the written word. The scriptures were complete before the end of the first century. God has granted unto us everything pertaining to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1, 3. That was in keeping with Jesus' promise. First century Christians accepted these writings as inspired. These letters were exchanged among the churches. Um, look at that. Look at that passage in Colossians 4, if you would. Colossians 4, 16. It's just a practical note. As Paul concludes this letter to the Col Colossian Christians, verse 16, he says, when this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Now that statement is proof that all of these letters were shared. They were distributed. And I'm confident, read, written down, and then sent to other churches. The seven churches of Asia. Well, you've got seven churches there. Um, got that one letter. So they'd have to be shared and distributed among those seven churches, the churches of Galatia, and so on. So we get a pretty good picture here how letters were distributed. And eventually all the churches would have those letters. Um, I would really like to sing a at least one song, if time permits. So can we, let's put our studies aside for the moment, and let's go ahead and sing some songs before we, we close out tonight. 802, how about 802?